Good evening, everybody. Thanks for battling the snow. It's pretty outside. There's a bunch of soft New Englanders, I've noticed, who are canceling events and saying the roads are bad. What's up with all this? It's just flurries, right? Right, for all of you anyway. So welcome to our first uh, official John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum of the spring semester. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here. I want to welcome everybody to the Harvard Kennedy School uh, for tonight's forum. We have a couple treats for tonight. First, look under your seats. Some of you may have an envelope with screening passes for a Wednesday night Boston premiere of the movie, courtesy of Sony Pictures. So if you have a piece of paper with a number, you can stop by the table up at the entryway uh, and take a poster home with you. So I see a couple people with the, uh, so we've got one. So congratulations to all the winners. Sorry to those who are watching on TV and on the internet. We would also like to pay a special welcome to the students watching via the live stream from University of Southern California, Arizona State, and University of Texas at Austin. We're really glad to have those three schools with us. The students at those schools are part of the IOP's national campaign. Uh, there's 25 schools across the country that participate, and we're really glad that three of them are having watch parties back on campus uh, with our Pac-12 and uh, SEC brethren, so welcome. Our box up on the uh, Loge area that's often reserved for, uh, or is one of the potential places to ask questions, we're reserving that for some students, and some of our students are going to receive questions, if there are any, from those three campuses, and they may ask a question on behalf of those students. Uh, tonight's panel is going to be moderated by Diane McWhorter. Diane McWhorter. Diane is the A.M. Rosenthal Writer in Residence at the Shorenstein Center here at the Harvard Kennedy School and is a scholar in residence at Kirkland House. We're really glad to have her. She's the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Carry Me Home, the history of the civil rights revolution in her hometown of Birmingham, Alabama. She's currently working on a book about Werner von Braun and the Third Reich missile pioneers who were brought to Alabama after the war and who helped build the rockets that sent the first man on the moon. And she's a long time contributing. Many of you probably read her works, uh, her pieces in the New York Times, in USA Today, where she is a contributor. Now, first though, we're gonna show a little bit of a preview of the movie, and then when it's over, uh, Diane's gonna kick off the conversation. So please join me with welcoming Diane. We have the trailer coming up, right? While we must and will win this war, we should also remember the high price that will be paid if the very foundation of modern society is destroyed. There's a Michelangelo joke to be made. You're just the man to make it. We have been tasked to find and protect art that the Nazis have stolen. Well, the chaps are all very anxious to get started. We have your architect from Chicago, a sculptor, a director of design at the School of Fine Arts, and a few other experts in various fields of art. How are the fellows making out? Like Olympians! We want to go into a war zone and tell our boys what they can and cannot blow up. That's the idea. If you would just read the orders. I'll tell you what these orders say. Don't knock out Colonel old DeBilt. Do not interrupt me, Lieutenant. I think that went well. We're going to start with a friend in Paris who's going to have some idea where the French art has been hidden. How can I help you steal our stolen art? The Nazis are taking everything with them, so we have to get as close to the front as we can. Look at this. It says if Hitler dies or if Germany falls, they're to destroy everything. Everything. We got to move. They tell us who cares about art, but they're wrong. It is the exact reason that we're fighting for a culture, for a way of life. What is all this? People's lives. Hitler wants everything. It's your responsibility now. Come on, give me a hand! I'm proud of what we're doing here. You're gonna miss me so much when this is all over. All hell's breaking loose here! We have some unfinished business.
Hey, welcome everyone. How's the ticker? We have a wonderful the ticker? evening of uh, movie stars, uh, Michelangelo and Nazis, and a Harvard dropout. That's the last comment I'm going to make about Matt dropping out of Harvard. Um, live and in person tonight, um, and I just want to say that I am an expert on Nazi rocket scientists, not Nazi art thieves, so I'm going to defer a lot to the panel tonight. Um, live and in person here, we have Lucia Ale, who teaches at Princeton and is here this year at Harvard at the Radcliffe Institute. She is an architectural historian who's working on a book about um, the international protection of monuments uh, throughout the 20th century from a variety of ravages, including but not limited to war. And uh, center stage here, we have uh, Robert Edsel, who uh, by saying that he wrote the book on which the, that movie trailer was based, uh, does not do credit to the, to the amount, uh, to the extent to which he's brought this subject before the public. He has written three books on the protection of art, rescuing and protection of art at, during World War II. Um, Monuments Men uh, is now on the best, Times bestseller list, ahead of The Wolf of Wall Street, I notice. So <laughs> students, that means you can do good and do well. And um, Robert has a foundation dedicated to the documenting and uh, preserving the legacy of this mission that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and then Skyping in from an undisclosed location, we have uh, Matt Damon. Welcome home, Matt. I'm sorry you couldn't be here in person. The weather is exquisite. I am too. I am too. Uh, yeah, I have a very early uh, uh, kind of uh, press, press day tomorrow here in New York. So um, I don't know if I was supposed to disclose that location or not. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, before we start grilling you, we're going to let Robert uh, explain what we just saw in the trailer and how these movie stars were based on actual people. These Monuments Men, it's kind of a clunky name, but it's a group of museum directors, curators, art historians, artists themselves, middle-aged, all had established careers, all, jobs that you'd dream of. Um, most of them had families, many of them had kids, and they had every reason in the world to not do this. But they felt they had a contribution to make during World War II to try and become a new kind of soldier, one charged with saving rather than destroying. And at its heart, this is a very uplifting people story. We talk a lot about the objects that were saved and the importance of them, but we can't lose sight of the great sacrifice that these men and women went through, two of whom were killed during combat. Um, we've made adjustments to the names because there have been adjustments to the characters for dramatic storytelling purposes, and we felt it wasn't fair to give somebody a drinking problem if in real life one of these distinguished veterans didn't have that. And in fact, we changed the names of most of the Nazis, with the exception of Goering and Hitler, not because they weren't bad, they were, but they, most of them had kids when the war was going on, two and three years old, and I didn't see any reason, and I think George and Grant felt strongly about that too. There wasn't any reason to bring that into it. It's all in the book. Uh, the actors, uh, and George and Grant in particular, uh, felt very impassioned about this and really uh, poured their hearts out. And the excitement, I think, of portraying these remarkable men and women and telling their real life story, and it's a story that they, like I, didn't know about at the beginning. And it has a very strong Harvard connection that doesn't really come out in the movie. Um, we're going to, uh, before we toss it to Matt, we're going to show a clip where the George Clooney character recruits Matt for this mission, and uh, let's, can we see that? How's the ticker? Still ticking. You want to get in the war? Monuments, man. Signed by Roosevelt. Oh, I see that. I'm to put a team together and try to protect what's left and find what's missing. Aren't you a little old for that? Yes. You want to go into a war zone and tell our boys what they can and cannot blow up? That's the idea. Okay, how many men? For now, six. Jesus. Mm. With you, that's seven. <laughs> that's much better. We're going to go through basic in Shrivenham, England, and then we wait for orders. Basic? Mm -hmm. Basic training. Us. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, Matt, we have you back. So, um, Robert, do you want to describe who uh, the George Clooney character is? He's sort of the protagonist of the, the book, certainly. Um, yeah, it's a fellow named George Stout, who was a pioneer in the conservation of works of art. He worked at the Fog uh, here at Harvard, and he uh, had the vision to see 
long time before World War II begins with the United States involved, that there's going to be another war. And the great risk is that in the process of trying to defeat Nazism, so much of Western civilization is going to be destroyed by the Allies with best of intentions. So it's this idea of creating this cultural preservation officer, and he's going to pitch it to Matt's character, a man named Jim Rorimer, who goes on to be the sixth director of the Metropolitan Museum after the war. Matt, he's a great character. Uh, Tell us about it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's it's great to be uh, to be speaking here. Uh, I was just saying this is my first time over at the Kennedy School, and I'm not speaking about acting or screenwriting. I'm speaking about art. So, <laughs> wish me luck. Um, no, I, it, it, it was a really. Uh, I thought George and Grant did a really great job with the script because um, Robert's book, which is fantastic, and I I really recommend it to anybody there tonight. And I didn't know it was on the bestseller list, but it should be. It's a really wonderful piece of work. And um, but anytime you're dealing with something that's that that's got that much information and you're trying to boil it down to a two hour movie, um, it, it, it's 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 a real it's a it's a real tough task for the person doing the adaptation. Um, and so ultimately, you have to say, I'm not going to do the book. I'm going to do my, I'm going to do the best movie version possible of, of of this book, and I've had these conversations with Cormac McCarthy because I was in an adaptation of one of his things, and and he said, yeah, the book exists and the movie exists, and you just have to you just have to look at it that way. So um, so I thought they did a really wonderful job um, telling this story, but telling it in a way that was really entertaining. And as Robert said, it's an incredibly uplifting story because at the centerpiece of it is are, is this decision that was made independently by all these um, people. Um, about the value of art and the value of art and, 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 and whether or not it's worth a human life and whether or not it's, it's, it's worth my, my life. And, and every one of those people came to the determination that it in fact was. And, and that's why it's such a beautiful story because it's about on a larger level, what, what, what role does art play in our society? You know, and then that's a personal question for everybody. Matt, what did you, uh, if I were, if this were Letterman, I would ask you if it was tougher to prepare for this role than for soul kissing uh, Michael Douglas. But um, <laughs> I guess the more, the more uh, uh, obvious uh, uh, connection would be, uh, you know, you, it's almost as if Private Ryan, who you played, what, in 1998, has grown up to become yeah. a successful museum director and then is sent back into the war. To see it from a whole different side, did did that did that come did they, did that come to play at all in your preparation for it? Going yeah, back to I the private writing. Yeah, I thought a lot about days? that just because it was the first time I'd done a World War II piece, um, you know, and put those uniforms back on, and and um, you know, George even has a D-Day landing. It's the second movie I've been in with a D-Day landing that I'm not involved in, or, <laughs> or an Omaha Beach landing. Uh, but George does it in a really interesting way, is where the Monuments Men get put down on Omaha Beach a month after D-Day. And it's just this empty, it's, it's Omaha Beach like you've never seen it before. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Um, there's a lot of really wonderful stuff that, that George and Grant kind of um, uh, uh, put into it that give it this kind of huge scale, but, um, but in, 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 in a different way. OK. So uh, Lucia, uh, Lucia is, is so cosmopolitan that she has an Italian first name and a French last name. <laughs> and she's going to tell us a little <laughs> bit about the, uh, just how this came about. And when you see the movie, you'll see how ad hoc and improvised and on a shoestring it is. And it's just a miracle that they accomplished as much as they did and that they were as prepared as they were. So to set us up a little bit about how, how they got the name and... Yeah, and, and well, the, the fact that it's called Monuments Men relates to the fact that they were originally meant to protect all monuments, whatever they found, whether it was uh, destroyed by one of their, their own or whether it was destroyed by an enemy army. And, uh, and in fact, the, the movie brings out very well the kind of comical element of having art historians and conservators suddenly have to put on um, uniforms. In fact, at the very beginning, Harvard was involved in convincing the army to even have this program. So the Paul Sachs, who was the director of the FOG, gets in touch with people who are educating officers in Charlottesville, Virginia, and says, we think you should preserve monuments when you go there. And to their surprise, the colonel says, OK, which ones? 
And so then the art historians suddenly have to start making lists, much in the same way as these uh, monuments men on the ground have to scramble through basic training. Art historians have to suddenly make lists of monuments in three months, and they use tourist guides to do it, and they debate which one is a three-star monument and which one is a two-star monument. And then they send the list, and the list returns to them with a comment that you should stop trying to teach us art history. We really only care what people there care about. So there's a, there's a kind of a element where art history becomes this form of expertise that unexpectedly becomes very useful to the army. But, yeah. but it did be become a very broad program, which was applied to every US commander who was carrying a list of uh, a list and a map of monuments wherever they went, and they were meant to protect them. And Robert, I love the setup of the book where it's right after Pearl Harbor, and, and the, the, the sense of fear that the museums on the coast in particular had that, that their artwork was going to get bombed. Mm -hmm. And they were, t tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's, it's a September 11th moment in 1941, and I was in New York on, on September 11th, and remember all too well the, the assumptions, the fear, the expectation something else bad was getting ready to happen, and uh, the idea of seeing these maps of the United States where the entire air traffic grid is blank. There's not a single airplane in the United States. So we go back to World War II. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the shock is so severe. And George Stout, who's already, uh, in That's the previous Clooney. year, yeah, George Clooney's character, uh, Frank uh, George Stokes, has been preparing pamphlets about how to protect cultural treasures in expectation there's going to be a war. So there's a Western Union telegram that goes out to museum directors across the country, uh, the most prominent institutions, to come to the Met. And they're walking up the steps of the Met just days before Christmas. And a presentation's put on by George Stout and Paul Sachs uh, about the importance of everyone rising to the occasion and how to go about protecting America's cultural treasures. Because the fear at the moment is uh, invasion of the West Coast by Japanese or bombing on the East Coast by the Nazis. But much has happened after September 11th. In the weeks that passed, it became fairly evident that there wasn't going to be any follow-up, that that was the extent of the disaster at the moment. And at the same point in time, it emerged very clearly that the United States is now in this war, and they're going to have to go to Europe and fight it. And in the process of taking these extraordinary new technologies, the power of bombing and the fire bombing, that without proper precaution, the United States might eliminate so much of Western civilization. So this, we, we spend a lot of time in the film and in the story talking about the role of these monuments officers as art detectives. Uh, but this wasn't how it started out. That wasn't the intention at the beginning. The intention was to try and avoid damage, as Lucia said, so much of it caused by the Western allies to soften up landing beaches. And then the, 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 the narrative is, is how it dawns on the, the team that they're not just dealing with, as you said, ch protecting churches and, and you know, uh, these monuments and towns, but they're dealing with this just systematic. Uh, why don't you talk, talk a little bit about that? About the, about yeah, I mean, I think that's maybe the next clip that we see. But essentially, this is a, a kind of war where suddenly art becomes implicated in this machinery to collect and move and relocate and protect and sometimes destroy art. And art becomes part of this new kind of war where everything is bureaucratized, everything is made into a system. And so I, the monuments men who were there to maybe follow the army along suddenly are faced with their own, very own task, which is that they enter places where art has been collected systematically and has been geared towards very specific goals. Yeah, so let's watch the next clip and we'll go back to Matt on Kate Blanchett's character. <laughs> What is all this? People's lives. What people? Jews. Maybe surprised to know if you've seen Hollywood movies that the Holocaust has hit rather subtly in this in this movie, and that's interesting. That uh, in real life, uh, Matt, your character was Jewish. Did you, uh, did you? Was there some decision on the part of the filmmakers that that was just going to be too too much to get into? No, um, I, I think I think what they've done is found a different way to tell it. And Matt and Kate have just uh, knocked it out of the ballpark in in depicting this the tension between. His character, uh, uh, Granger, and Kate Blanchett's character, Claire Simon, 
who both are people of destiny and they recognize it, but they each have half the key. Valon, who knows where these stolen works of art are, but she has no methods of transportation or authority to get there. Why don't you, let's, let's say who Rose, Rose Vallon is. She's, she's in a way the, the character in the movie who's most faithful to the real person, I would say. Yeah, well, I think there's many, but I mean, look, for all you women that have gone, have been great sports and gone to World War II movies with us guys, this is your movie. <laughs> because this woman is an incredible, incredible heroine of civilization that's never gotten her due, in particular in France. And, uh, and so the two of them, uh, she's working under the eyes of the Nazis in this museum, the Jeux de Palme, and for four years, understanding German, watching all of the loot taken from the German, the, from the uh, French family, so many of whom were great Jewish collectors and dealers, and she's making notes, she's hiding them in her clothes, she's digging through trash cans. They almost caught her twice. They would have shot her had they caught her. And then when the Americans arrive, Matt's character, she won't give it to the French because she doesn't know who to trust, but she also doesn't trust the Americans at the beginning. And it's this courtship that they go through with Matt's character trying to win the trust and Kate's character uh, realizing that at some point in time uh, she's got to find someone that she's going to turn this information over to. And Matt, why don't you describe the scene that follows with Take, you, you go to the, there, in, the, in this warehouse of Jewish goods that have been expropriated from homes of, of Jews. There's a, a wonderful scene, which we'll give away. You want to describe that, Matt? Of the, going well, yeah, back, that, going that, that back to the apartment. Just, uh, I'm going back to uh, the apartment. The, the apartment, going the back apartment, to the apartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, incidentally, the, the, the scene you just showed, that's all based on actual photographs. Um, there's a really horrible photograph of a giant warehouse filled with literally people's lives. Um, but you know, it's not, <clears throat> the, the film was never going to be a Holocaust movie, but you can't talk about World War II really without talking about that. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think George and Grant really came up with an elegant way to do it. Um, you know, and the scene that follows is, is, is Granger goes back to a house. He, he, he replaces a, he puts a piece of art back in a home of, um, some Jews who've been rounded up. Uh, he, yeah, he finds the address on the back of it. probably never be back. Right. So yeah, he, he finds the, I was gonna say, you find the address on the back of the painting, and then... Exactly, yeah. he finds the address and he goes to this house and it's kind of a, an exercise in futility, but it, it's really the moment in the movie that kind of wins the... Um, you know, uh, Robert does an amazing job in the book of documenting their relationship and, 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 you know, my guy, Romer, actually said that he felt like he was being groomed <laughs> as she was kind of supporting him, you know, because she was about to trust him with, you know, this, this incredible responsibility um, that she had taken on her own and as said, at, at great risk to herself. I mean, she would have been summarily executed if they knew what she was doing. But she was so unassuming, she was literally living right under their noses and commanding everything for years, um, and how uh, we were able to recover so much. Yeah, there's a little culture tip. There's a, a John Frankenheimer movie called The Train that was made in 1964, yeah. which is based on her memoir. Um, and there's a, it's in your book, it's not in the, uh, in the movie so much, that, the, that she, uh, the resistance with her help thwarts the Nazis from getting the, uh, the, all the artwork that's stored in the Jeu de Pomme um, out of uh, France, ahead of the, Alli ahead of the Allies. Um, I've got it out of Lamont Library, but I'm, I'll take it back so you can get it. <laughs> Maybe it'll be a waiting list. Um, let's see. Um, so let's. So the this the, the movie. Uh, Robert, do you want to talk a little bit more about how they? Uh, it, let, well, let's talk about what to set up the our, the, the last clip we're going to see. What exactly were the Germans doing with this art? I, I know that we can't get into exactly, there are many things, but in the, in, for the purposes of the movie, you want to just talk yeah. about the Fuhrer Museum? Well, the, the looting is of a nature we've never seen before in war, premeditated, organized with uh, whole groups of troops, organized not just to fight the war, <clears throat> but these are dedicated to the theft and transportation of works of art back, many of which are targeted and uh, sought out, such as the again altarpiece and the Bruges Madonna by Michelangelo. The it, looting is so pervasive, it's hard to summarize it, but uh, the easiest way to do it is Goering uh, has a voracious appetite, and he collects for himself. He thinks he's this great Renaissance man. 
he utters lines that, like so many elements of this story, Hollywood can't make it up, because who could dream of a guy saying something like, I intend to plunder and I intend to do it thoroughly? But this is a quote of Herman Goering and exactly what he did do. Uh, and so he makes some 20 visits to this museum that Cape Lanchette character character's working at, the Jeux de Pomme, to go on shopping expeditions and make selections of works of art for his own collection, noting those that are so famous he's got to set them aside for the Fuhrer. Adolf Hitler considers himself this great artist. He's a failed uh, student of art and architecture at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. He has this desire to build a museum in his hometown of Linz. In fact, he's going to rebuild the town, and at the center is going to be this cultural complex known as the Gamalda Gallery Linz, but it was referred to as the Fuhrer Museum, and it's going to house some of the great works of art. Uh, in the final stages, uh, there were certainly, throughout the war as Hitler rises to power, removal of some 20,000 works of art which Hitler considered degenerate from German museums, some of which were destroyed. These are paintings by Monet, Picasso, Paul Clay, uh, painters we love today, Van Gogh yeah. and others. Uh, but uh, many other works that he loved were going to go to this museum. So at the, the, there are lots of destructions of works of art by the Nazis, and so many of these things are in peril in the closing days of the war, a period I refer to as the void, when the bad guys aren't in control anymore, but the good guys aren't in control yet. And you have a lot of independent actions by really rabid Nazis believing that it's the intent of the Fuhrer to destroy these things and not allow anybody to have them since Germany's going to lose the war. And it's that void that these monuments officers uh, work in, and it's an incredibly challenging and harrowing period of time. So, Luke, to you, because we're, uh, we try to be fair and balanced at the Kennedy School, um, do you want to, like, put in a little plug for the Germans? Because they did do, uh -huh. they, they well, did, yeah. I mean, the, it's true the, the film emphasizes the kind of personal megalomania uh, of of uh, the you know Hitler and his intimate circle, they were the ERR, which is this this troops uh, devoted to rounding up art. They were, there's maybe two more uh, art projects that the Nazis had, I should say. One which was in a way even more sinister, which was that some of the art which was rounded up, which wasn't the masterpieces, was meant to be then redistributed because remember that uh, Germany wanted to conquer an entire part of Germany and repopulated with the Germans and the, 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 new, the new Germans needed their living realm, their Lebensraum, which is living space, and they needed some culture. And so the art would be redisseminated into new cultural institutions. But there is also a smaller uh, arm of the German army, which was called the Kunstschutz, which was uh, in propaganda described as the equivalent of the monuments men who were there. And Kunstschutz means the protection of art. And they were there presumably to protect the art whenever uh, Germany occupied a, a territory. So there's much debate among historians about whether the Kunstschutz was purely propaganda or whether they actually did some protection. And there's a lot of work being done on individual figures. But and what about, how did and this all began in World War I? That's true. Actually, the very first Kunstschutz was in World War I when the, uh, the very first sort of organized uh, uh, idea of taking art historians and putting them in, uh, in positions to protect art was took place in Belgium when uh, Germany um, occupied Belgium and had uh, Paul Clemen, who was a very famous art historian, in charge of protecting the Belgian art. And there's now a controversy about that also, about whether or not he was truly protecting or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, the idea of having a protection art, an art protection unit, was a German one. Mm -hmm. uh, but we must say, in fairness, created in, as a consequence of having destroyed yes, the right library now. at Louvain yes. During combat, this wasn't an idea they had it preemptorily. Right. It was reacting to the outrage around the world that this library was destroyed. And boy, if you want a perfect example of history repeating itself, within weeks of the Nazis invading Western Germany during World War II, the rebuilt Library of Louvain, which had been restocked with so many books that were forced out of Germany as compensation at the end of the war is burned again. The same place all over again. So there's the, there's the reminder for us. Now, let's, let's go to the, our, our other last clip, and we'll get Matt to talk a little bit about locations and whatnot and what it was like filming these scenes. The, the two, uh, the leading, the star, the artworks that are stars of the movie are the Madonna, uh, the Bruges Madonna of Michelangelo and the Ghent altarpiece. And that's, the quest is to, is to find them. So this is sort of t uh, coming up toward the end when they're about to find the last hiding place.
the roof skis coming up at the end because they, they're, they're in the, uh, what will become the Soviet zone. So there's sort of a race not only to, to beat the Nazis but also to get there ahead of the, the Soviets. Because the Soviets have been taking, they, they, they've been taking their art, the artwork back as sort of reparations. Uh, whereas the Americans' attitude is that it, they belong where, you know, they, they need to go back to their rightful owners. Um, Matt, um, you will be here in a sec. Um, uh oh, wait. Oh, here you come are. Back. Am I, am <laughs> come I not back. There? Yeah, yeah. So come let's back. let's hear. <laughs> yeah. So let's hear some. I'm sure you'll be asked about this in the question and answer. But what what was it? Wh where were these things filmed? And what was it like recreating that? Uh, well, it was it was incredible. We we shot in uh, in Berlin. Um, Berlin doubled for really everywhere uh, for Paris and um, you know really the the the. Biggest kind of story for us while we were shooting was we had a horrible weather. It was the worst <laughs> spring, and I use the term loosely, um, in in Berlin in like 150 years. And so there was snowstorm after snowstorm. Um, we burned through our cover set really fast. Cover set is are the scenes you save to, that are indoors. So if you have inclement weather, you can move inside to your cover set. We were through our cover set in the first week, and then we started to have have to move scenes that were supposed to be springtime in Paris. Uh, in, in you know into like cafes inside and things like that because the weather really wasn't cooperating. They, you know it was so cold that there were there was one night where I was supposed to be walking down the street in shirt sleeves, you know, carrying a grocery bag, and my only direction from George was um, to not exhale because you'd see my breath. And so all of the extras walking behind also were told these German extras to. Under no turn, uh, turn are, you, are, you, are you under no circumstances are you to exhale or you're going to ruin the shot? So we all held our breath for 30 seconds and pretended it was warm out. <laughs> okay, where were the where were the cave scenes uh, shot? Was it, were those were those just sets? Those were shot at uh, at um, uh, gosh, why am I? Uh, uh, Gerbils built uh, Baron. What's that? Hearts Mountains. The Hearts Mountains. Okay. No, no, no. That's where the yeah. That's where the uh, exterior. But the, um, but the interiors were shot at Babelsberg. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just blanking on the yeah. name of the studio. Okay. Gerbils built ba Babelsberg, and then he built Berendorf in Prague. They really got into their movie making um, um, uh, because, you know, to get the word out. But, um, but uh, Babelsberg is a great, you know, it's a 100-year-old it's uh, studio um, right outside Berlin. Right, so yes. It's a, it's a, Fritz shot Lang, some of the yeah. right there. It's a great um, place to shoot. Great. Okay, so let's uh, just as a public service, do you want to talk about uh, what liberties you had to take uh, historically? I know you were you were a consultant on it. Was there anything that you think the audience would need to know uh, that would, or conversely, things that may seem totally made up that that? Well, were I think real? one of the ironies here is that uh, some of the scenes that you might think are uh, Hollywood creations are the most, ones most likely that happened largely, as you're going to see. Um, there is humor during war, it's sometimes gallows humor, but this is how people survive these horrible depredations. When you have a group of middle-aged museum directors, curators, art historians, and scholars, no disrespect to present company included, putting on military uniforms, going into harm's way, two of whom were killed in combat, by the way, uh, you know, that's a pretty, that's got a lot of humorous moments in it, and then you start matching up um, some of the characters which are so well depicted. So there's scenes such as um, a toothache that uh, leads to an important discovery of information. 
That happened, and we were able to learn about it because of these guys' letters home during the war. There were a lot of other scenes like that. So I think you're going to see things that are very gripping in that respect, but also some funny things that, are, um, that ex exactly happened, as you'll see. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's put it this way. Matt said it beautifully. You've got a, a story that's got a massive geographical scope over a large period of time involving millions of stolen objects, some five million by the time the monuments officers come back home in 1951. Five million things. And uh, different people that are in different places. That is, the, two hours goes by in a snap of a fingers, and George and Grant have done a masterful job finding a way to tell you the portion of the story that you need as a backstory about this period of looting that you haven't seen on the big screen in World War II movies, so that you can understand and enjoy the film. And uh, I, you know, my hat's off to them and to all the guys on the set that, that uh, really got into it. What was it? Uh, go ahead. Can I just add yeah. to that? As someone who is familiar with this archive, one of the most amazing things in the archive are these photographs. And you get the sense, just from looking at them, uh, that these uh, soldiers really wanted to, dis to document how unbelievable it was to walk into a mine and see the Ghent altarpiece <laughs> and to have that recognition because work, works of art are like that. They have an aura, then when you encounter them, it's as if you're encountering a person. And so those photographs at, in the film, those are absolutely, they're kind of recreated. I don't know if you recreated them, if you were given a photograph and told to pose a certain way, but for a historian, that was very striking to see that that moment of witnessing was really rendered in the film. Everything else, I sort of paid less attention to. <laughs> uh -huh. that's, that's really cool. Um, so for both of you, last question. Um, as a historian, I'm often struck at how history has its own timetable, <coughs> that there are certain stories that are hiding in plain sight for years, and then all of a sudden, the public is ready to to deal with them. What do you think it was, first you, Robert, what do you think it was that made this happen now? I know that you've been working on this for, for some 10 years or so. What do you think it was that, was it Clooney? Did, did it, what, what captured his imagination? Why do you think this is somehow being made into a feature film now? Um, well, yeah, the time's right. Um, 15, 16 years ago, 17 years ago, I had the question how in the, face of the most destructive war in history, all these things survived, and who were the people that saved it? I didn't know the answer, and the idea that we'd be, that I'd be writing three books or being involved in the film wasn't on my radar screen, because I, I just asked what seemed like a simple question. But the more I understood, the bigger the story seemed. And then, of course, when we went through Iraq with the American-led invasion in 2003, and there was a complete absence of remembering what the monuments officers did during World War II and horrible looting and the consequences of that, because we didn't have monuments officers there, that's when the power of the story really gripped me, mm -hmm. and why I created the Monuments Men Foundation was to reestablish the high bar for the protection of cultural treasures and also engage the public, you all, to help find these missing works of art that are still out there, many of which were brought home by soldiers as souvenirs after the war. So I think there's that component of it, and now, um, Certainly. I mean, I wrote, I told George and Grant this. I've told Matt this on set. In fact, I told this to everybody on set. Years from now, three or four years from now, when the discussion of protection of cultural property is commonly shared among people, the idea of cultural patrimony, the idea of looted art, we're going to look back and someone's going to say, why is it that everyone's talking about this and we never talked about it before? And it's going to be the... Uh, arc of this film. It, this is going to, that's going to be the wake that this film leaves because it's going to be a gong that's going to arouse people's interest. And when you have discoveries like what took place in Munich last November that was a sensational announcement about a billion and a half euros worth of art, whether or not it's that much, it doesn't give context. What this film's going to do is have everybody have a chance to understand how all these pieces fit together and it's all going to make a lot more sense. And so George and Grant and Sony, we have to say Sony, because these are difficult films to finance, uh, these period films. They're, they're uh, a real challenge. And George thinks no small thoughts. And he and Grant uh, invested years of their life to, as and Matt knows far better than all of us, to uh, write the script, uh, direct, produce, uh, and star in it. I mean, it's, it's a lot of homework, isn't it, Matt? <laughs> It's, it's a lot. Yeah, they, they, there was, it was a heavy lift for them, definitely. But, you know, going back to what you just said, um, that, that first m meeting um, that, that Paul Sachs and, and George Stout convened, um, 
I don't remember from the book if it was out of that meeting or out of a subsequent one, but they, they this, the, the kind of this, this mission statement or what came out of that, and it was it's so beautiful to read the way these people thought about art, and it really does, it really does get kind of make your heart hurt when you when you think about what happened in Baghdad, and that, and, and as you say, Rob, that total lack of, you know, of just remembering value of this stuff to, to these cultures and, and, and to all of us, really, and, um, and the fact that there was no thought given to that. Um, when, when there were these wonderful people who, who kind of trailblazed and kind of pioneered this way to do this, and, and all we had to do was learn our history, and uh, the world could have been so much different, you know? Yeah. Lucia, is there some final thought about the, the, the way that war is seen? That yeah, I mean, the, World War II was a kind of war where the invading army was projected to have bec to have to become an occupying army, and and you were the idea was the the local populations would be more willing to look favorably upon an occupying army if that army had shown respect to the local uh, cultural monuments, and that's why it wasn't just the important masterpieces, but also every local church and shrine that was on the list. And so, of course, the war in Iraq was famously not a war of occupation, presumably, and, and one didn't want to beset the soldier with a list of monuments in his backpack because he was meant to be light and, and stealthy. So certainly the discussion about what kind of war one leads and what the implication is, not necessarily for art. If you, There are plenty of people who will continue to argue that art is not uh, what one fights wars for, but for the continuance of the civil order so that you civil in, institutions continue even through wars, and as part of that continuity, uh, the monuments men did the right thing. But we've learned, we've learned this. Sending soldiers to protect us or to go into conflict with guns without bullets is as foolish as sending them with bullets and not sending monuments officers in alongside them. Because if we don't do these things, the roadside devices are going to get so set sooner when people's passions are inflamed about showing disrespect for their cultures. The sniping is going to begin sooner. So I say, and I say it with a straight face and an absolute conviction, that the work of the Monuments Men Foundation, the lasting achievement of this film, I believe this is how you affect public policy. You want to figure out how to get things done in Washington? Let them know that the voters know, because who's against this idea? And this is, the, this is the, going to be the lasting legacy, that we have to show respect for the cultural treasures of others. We don't have to understand them. We don't even have to like them. But it worked during World War II because the leaders led. It worked at President Roosevelt's level and General Eisenhower's level. And that's what we need to get reinstilled today. And I don't know of a more effective, faster way of doing it than people in leadership, not only in our country, but around the world, seeing what took place during World War II and asking themselves, why can't we do that again? OK, good Kennedy School message. Let's open it up to questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here are the instructions that you probably all know. Keep your questions brief. Have them in, in a question mark. And please identify yourself uh, before you ask your question. And you can direct it to a particular person or now, are we starting? OK, yeah, we'll start with you. So line up to the microphone. OK, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, th first of all, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Niat Muligeta, and I'm the chair of the National Campaign Committee here at the IOP. And we work directly with the schools that are tuning in uh, via live feed tonight. So the first question um, is from Cody Freer from Arizona State University. Um, given that the German police recently discovered over 1,400 works of art at the Munich flat of Cornelia Scarlett, what do you believe is the future of World War II art recovery? Robert. Well, look, there are hundreds of thousands of works of art and cultural objects still missing from the war. And uh, there are many things that went to the former Soviet countries that are still there. Some were returned in 1956, but there's still many there. But they're in the United States. They're in Great Britain. They're in France. They're in Germany. Um, these things were picked up oftentimes by soldiers as a souvenir, and I say that. I serve on the National World War II Museum Board in New Orleans, our nation's World War II Museum, and I have a lot of friends that are World War II veterans. I've never had anyone take exception with that. These young kids 
were coming home and wanted to be able to, to prove to their family that uh, they were over in Europe, they were in Hitler's home, and they wanted mementos of the fact they made it home and a lot of their buddies didn't. So there were things that were picked up that shouldn't have been. And w the foundations worked with a number of veterans to get these things back and return them to archives or uh, to libraries in the case of some books that we found from, from Naples. What we need to do, what, what we're trying to do anyway, is engage the public to help us find these things. The, no one's ever done that before. Nobody had a bully pulpit like we have from this film. And George and Grant and Sony have been hugely enthusiastic and supportive of our effort with the foundation. We've created a toll-free number, one eight six six world war II art wwii -I -I art and that reaches our office in in dallas we have researchers there we don't charge anybody and we try and identify things and help illuminate the path to go home so the thing in, in uh, that you're describing in munich is a very complicated case but it illustrates the point that there are a lot of things that are still missing in the tools of technology today and public awareness from this film can engage the public to help us find them and there, there's a story in the New York Times uh, Arts and Leisure section this week about uh, fi uh, getting the French artwork back to the heirs mm -hmm. of, the, of the Jewish uh, art dealers that they were stolen from. And a journalist didn't have too much trouble finding a few of the heirs. And so, you know, there's a, a, an implication of, of a certain lack of Johnny on the spotness, perhaps. Um, are we, let's see, yeah. Hi, thank you all again so much for being here. I'm Amna, a sophomore at the college. Uh, this is a question for Matt Damon, but there are such big, amazing actors involved in this project, and I was wondering what you and sort of the other actors involved were motivated by to do a project like this, and also the other projects that you do that have such historical and artistic significance. Well, uh, thank you. It, it, um, it was a very easy decision for me because the script was so good. And um, I honestly, go, but to that earlier question about why this movie wasn't made earlier, I, I really don't know. I, it, I couldn't believe that I didn't know this story. Um, I, my jaw dropped as I read Robert's book. I, I, it seemed like we should, this is something that all of us should have heard about. Uh, and it seemed like kind of a natural fit for a movie, like a really, uh, a, a way to a way to, to to document this this kind of time in history and tell a really great tale, but also be really entertaining. It's funny. It kind of feels like a heist movie, a heist movie and a war movie at the same time. It's a lot of fun, um, and uh, and it's just it's just an incredible story that again at its heart is about the value of art in in our lives, and uh, and so that's a, a, a beautiful thing to, to to put out there. So it was a very easy decision. Um, most of my scenes are with Kate Blanchett. That also made it a very, very easy decision. Um, now, I worked with her 15 or 16 years ago on The Talents of Mr. Ripley and was floored by her then. And, and now she's just, she, she does this at a very high level that few people have ever reached, actually. She's really you got a chance to practice your painting, too, lying on your back. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't, I, know if that was, yeah, I don't know if I that did. was clear. That was at I the was Cloisters. There. And anybody who grew, any right. school child who grew up in New York has been to a field trip, on a field trip to the Cloisters. But, but Matt's character had been in charge of that at the time that he was recruited. And then, he, as Robert mentioned, he goes back and becomes the head of the uh, Metropolitan Museum for years. So he was a heavyweight. They, he, I, I noticed that, um, that Robert ref kept referring to your character in the in the book as a as the bulldog. Did you were you were you tr yeah. did you have that in, in mind at all when you were playing the part? A little or, bit. I mean, it it, it when you see the movie, it's uh you know it's 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 different from Rorimer's actual what what he actually did um, in some ways. Um, he's 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 trying to he's trying to coerce the Rose Villan character. He, he's he's less of a bulldog and more of a. Uh, he's, he's, he's kind of trying to use a light touch to try to, to try to get his way. And then when Hitler comes out with the Nero decree, you know, which basically says once he dies, then just burn it all, um, he, the James character gets a little more desperate. Diane, can I add something really quick? Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. not as light as what was just said, but one of the reasons that uh, it might have taken a long time for this story to get out, and, and you have uh, done your own sort of archival endeavor, but in archival terms, 50 years is often how long it takes for archives to open, and so the, the institutional archives, the, archives, the personal archives of people, it takes 50 years, and 50 years is also a very important number in terms of things becoming historic, 
So monuments, you know, objects have to be at least 50 years old to be considered cultural property, et cetera. So there might be some institutional forces at play that, that made this story, that delayed the, the mm -hmm. knowledge of the story. Also. At 57, I guess I'm, I'm cultural property right. now. Huh? <laughs> You're a monument. <laughs> You're a monument. Uh -huh. yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Max Liebeskind. I'm a member of the forum committee. Um, and I want to ask a question about one of the things you were discussing earlier, which is how the story of this movie um, can be put in play today. So how do you think that some of the issues that are dealt with in the movie can be, put, can be used today by the United States or by other countries, uh, especially in places where we currently are occupying, such as Afghanistan, which has a major issue of cultural preservation? Well, uh, it's a big question and it's a big challenge, but look, the mere fact that this film's going to be out there, George has said it a number of times, Matt said it earlier, this is an entertaining film. You're going to go and have a really, really good time, and let's not lose sight of that. It's not a history lesson per se, but as Matt said, it's one of those rare instances, and I had a long discussion with Hugh Bonneville about this, where... Um, it's a convergence, if you will, of philanthropy and commercialism of making film and trying to do good where this, there's this great, dramatic, entertaining story to be told, and the storytellers have done a great job doing that, and at the same point in time, they've understood the power of this thing to educate people, to engage them, and put it in, I mean, I always talk in terms of pedestrian Pedestrian language to describe stuff. It's not dumbing down. It's just getting it out of the art historical context where it's so complicated. I mean, I don't like to feel dumb, and sometimes when I read these things, I feel like, golly, I mean, I need to go back to school. I want to tell the story the way I heard it from the monuments men, the 17 monuments men and women that I interviewed, and so many of their kids. And reading this stuff, I thought it was the most exciting story I've ever heard. I still feel that way. And I think when you see the film, many people will feel that way too. But I don't know of a way, to, you know, there's no one that's against this. The problem with getting anything done in the world is you've got to be obsessively focused and, and have some willful ignorance to suspend all the people that are going to tell you why something can't be done. I did this on this project. I got down to where my best friends were saying, declare victory and go home. You've done enough. Well, I haven't done enough because if this film, if, this, if a film wasn't made of this story, we're selling a dollar for 10 cents and patting ourselves on the back. A story like this just doesn't come along very often. It's just a strange peculiarity, and not, your answer is partially correct, but it hasn't been told. So the power of this thing to educate, to engage people, to challenge younger people to use these technology skills that you've got so fluently like a three-year-old that grows up on skis, let's figure out how to use drones and other things to monitor what's going on in Syria and Cairo, places we can't and we're not going to send soldiers but to try and preserve these cultural treasures that belong to all of us. So it's a call to action in a way. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jennifer Page. I'm a teaching fellow here at the Kennedy School and a PhD student in the government department. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, how is it helpful um, or beneficial for the arc of the movie to uh, make James Warmore into James Granger and have him not be Jewish? To me, it seems entirely the opposite, that more would be at stake if he was portrayed in the film uh, as, as being Jewish. Well, that's an interesting opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, James Rohrmer in real life, uh, his family hid the fact that they were Jewish. They changed their name. They lived in Cleveland because uh, the degree of anti-Semitism in the United States was such that the family was alarmed and didn't believe that they could integrate and have the same opportunities as everybody else. So Jim, and I discuss that quite openly in the book about Jim Rohrmer, but I don't believe it's going to be lost. In fact, it, perhaps in a way it's more poetic, and I'm sure Max would, or, uh, Matt would have an opinion about this, perhaps it's more poetic that you have, first of all, several of the Monuments Men in the film the characters are Jews. Uh, Bob Balaban's character is Jewish. But maybe some that might be critical and take the other side of your argument would say that, of course, Jews are going to feel horrible seeing these um, signs of the Holocaust, both the looting that is in the scene that you saw of the warehouse filled with everyday household items, as well as uh, barrels filled with teeth from victims of the concentration camps. But perhaps it's more poignant, in a way, for these 
for you not to know who, whether someone's Jewish or Gentile, but see the human aspect, which cuts across all aisles, about the inhumanity of what they're witnessing and their belief that, that the saving of these things isn't about monetary context. It's the fact that these works of art and cultural treasures define the civilizations that Hitler was trying to destroy. It's not just about saving the lives. It's preserving the elements of the civilizations that he was trying to prove were subhuman and eliminate. So that humanity of it, I think, is brought out in the film. And in that respect, I think it's indifferent as to whether a character is portrayed Jew or not. One of the uh, characters, I should say, is uh, the Bob Balaban character is, is Lincoln Kirstein. So who you know brought Balanchine to America and and you know was the impresari cultural impresario of Lincoln Center and everything. So co-founded New York City Ballet. Yeah. So anyway, so it's really it's 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 quite a cast of characters. Uh, it's that's not clear. Every as as Robert said, everybody has a has given sort of a new identity. So so are you saying that Mr. Downton Abbey did not have a drinking problem in real life? <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 yes, I am saying that Hugh Bonifil does not have a drinking problem in real life. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I let's see. So sure. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't okay. say enthusiasm, I said problem. <laughs> okay, let's see. Are, okay, are we, we're, yeah. Are, we have another remote question? Yes. Okay. Um, this question is from a student at Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. Uh, and it reads like this. Earlier today, I read an article in a Jewish arts and culture magazine tablet written by Raphael Medoff. This article was written in response to Monuments Men and concerns American interventions to save cultural treasures versus Jewish lives during World War II. He states, when tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands, then millions of people are murdered, they become a kind of faceless blur, a numbing statistic in the public's mind. By contrast, the specific images of famous Rembrandt or Picasso paintings were personally familiar to many Americans, and that familiarity endangered the sympathy needed to bring about intervention. Does the film touch on this issue, and do you think that the movement to save cultural treasures might have hindered or replaced interventions to save Jewish lives? No, I don't. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, why can't we do both? And why does it have to be either or? I've read these arguments. Um, there were a whopping 120 monuments officers in Europe by May 8, 1945. Not 1,200, 12,000, or 1 1.2 million, but 120. Um, I don't think that's going to change the outcome with respect to the Holocaust, but it certainly changed the outcome with respect to the protection of these civilizations. And I think one of the messages that the film's conveying, and I think it does a very effective job of it, is that the Holocaust doesn't begin with the killing of people. They're incarcerated, but it begins with the humiliation of letting them know that the intention is to destroy everything they believe in, take everything they've got, and give it to somebody else, as Lucia explained. And then, yeah, they're going to kill them when it's all over. But it's the humiliation process that's, that's so pernicious about this. So, I believe that, uh, and I think this is a consistent theme of, of Holocaust, lowercase h. We saw it in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We saw it in Mali with the Taliban. It's destroy the things that people believe in that define them as a civilization. That's when it begins. It's not just the killing. And I think it's a noble endeavor of the Allies to try and save these things, to preserve some element of it. I mean, if, if we didn't have those 120 people and they were in the army trying to preserve concentrate or eliminate concentration camps or get people out sooner. I don't think that, that could have been done, but even had it been, and we'd have wiped out all of Western civilization, we'd be having a very different kind of debate today about why in the world didn't anybody think of that, but they did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Tim Devine, a freshman at the college. My question is, uh, how were um, other allies, non-Americans, involved with this or supportive of it, or were they? Yeah, I can answer that. The, the American policy was quite unique, um, and it's tied to the mode of bombing that America developed in the run-up and during the first years of the war. So the um, British, who were responsible for most of the bombing in the early part of the war, had developed a kind of airplane that could bomb indiscriminately, area bombing. And so if, you are, if that's your kind of airplane, you're not going to care very much about preserving certain uh, objects. The American policy was a policy of precision bombing, and so if you can have lists of targets, you can also have lists of non-targets. 
But at some point at the Casablanca conference in 43, when the, an allied round-the-clock policy was instituted, uh, it was decided that at some point uh, the destructive urges of the British and the Americans had to be synced in some way. That's the kind of simplification, but that basically is what happened. And so eventually the, the British, who had been in contact with the US forces over this question of monuments and museums, and you have to keep in mind as well that most museums in Europe had hidden their art anyways. All, all museum men and all uh, cathedral men knew that they were going to have to protect their art anyway. So there was some amount of preparation on the part of all nations. In any case, eventually the, the British started their own commission, which was called the Macmillan Commission, and then basically there were monuments men who were British as well as um, Americans. The uh, countries that were occupied usually had the local uh, sort of monuments keepers remain in their in their role, so they played a role as well. And, uh, and then, as I mentioned, sometimes there were cases where the Kunstruts, uh, as in Italy, the Kunstrut was claiming to be preserving art in one city, and then the American monuments then also came and sort of uh, you know, fought over it. And the Russians have a completely different story, which has to do with wanting revenge for um, many mm -hmm. millions of lives lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we only have uh, time for one more question. My name is Hasna Maudud, and I'm a fellow, visiting fellow at Ash Center Kennedy School. I want to congratulate the Kennedy School of Government Institute of Politics for arranging this discussion. This is movie, we all love to go to movie, but this has such an amazing message, and it cuts through religion. I'm not Jewish, but I'm so proud to be here, that these are all human heritage. This is an act of preserving the best of human endeavors. And, uh, and I'm glad a young man like Matt Damon, he's already gone to water org and, and so many things. We should also have art org and, and teach our young people to care for something like these priceless arts and monuments. I'm working on the Silk Road and I see that thousands of year old Buddhist paintings and murals are being preserved. These Ancient people had, uh, they knew where to do it. They, they made them in the caves far away in the desert rather than in the city, so they were preserved. So we all need to work together as people's army, and I want to congratulate the author that he should teach us how else we can help the, uh, preserve all the human uh, beautiful things that our artists have done which will not be replicated again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you tomorrow, Robert. <laughs>